Hi, it's Tuesday, the 15th of September, and I am continuing to read and wonder about the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts, the sequel to Luke's Gospel, and we're getting pretty close to the end, actually. Um, so soon we'll start on John's Gospel, but right now we need to finish up the story of, of, of the early church and how they came to be um, without the physical presence of Jesus, who has at this point ascended, led by the Spirit, um, led by, by James and Peter, but primarily by Paul in most of these stories. Um, and as I mentioned, Luke, or at least the author of Luke's Gospel, I'm going to call him Luke, uh, who occasionally writes in the first person here, so we assume that he is often in the presence of Paul. We've been hearing the stories of Paul um, in, in Antioch and, and, and spreading the faith and bringing Gentiles and traditional Jews together into community but not without controversy. Um, uh, traditional Jews uh, and, and Jewish authorities um, often referred to in the text as the Jews, but not all Jews, but some traditional Jews and some, some religious authorities have a real problem with Paul, and they've been following him around and causing trouble, and they have made false accusations against him, and he has been stoned, he has been imprisoned. Um, towards the end of of of, of this book of Acts. So we've been reading recently, Paul came down to um, Jerusalem and was in the temple being an obedient Jew, following the traditions, and yet um, some of those from, from, from Antioch uh, followed him and caused difficulty and trouble, and so he was arrested. He has been under house arrest now for over two years. Um, he has been in Caesarea. Uh, he is now before um, Agrippa. So he has been um, under arrest somewhat for his own good. And, and we keep hearing about this, the, 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 this, this group of, uh, of traditional um, Jewish folk who, who want him dead. And they have planned ambushes and they planned all sorts of things. They want him brought back to Jerusalem so they can kill him en route. Uh, that hasn't happened. And so as we pick it up um, in chapter 26, I'm going to read the first 18 verses which is um, Paul speaking to Agrippa. So right now you've got, you've, he's got the, the, the king's ear, as it were. Um, you may recall Agrippa is a Herodian king. So his actual name would be uh, King Herod Agrippa II. His father, King Herod Agrippa I, usually called a Herod. Uh, king Herod um, had, had imprisoned uh, Paul and uh, had James, son of Zebedee, martyred, had him killed. Um, but, but the Herodian um, reign has been supportive of the Jews. They are, they are Jewish supporters. So um, perhaps they have it in for Paul because, as I mentioned, some of the traditional Jewish authorities aren't crazy about Paul. Um, but Paul's hoping that Agrippa will understand. Anyway, all of that background to give you these words, and then I'm just going to wonder about them. Here we go. Chapter 26, verse 1 through 18. Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began to defend himself. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, because you are especially familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg of you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, a life spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I have belonged to the strictest sect of our religion and lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial on account of my hope in the promise made by God to our ancestors, a promise that our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. It is for this hope, Your Excellency, that I am accused by Jews. Why is it? Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what I did in Jerusalem, with authority received from the chief priests. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, when at midday along the road, Your Excellency, 
I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. I asked, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so they may turn away from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The first part of Paul's testimony. Not all of it. We'll get more tomorrow. But there's a little bit to wonder about here. Um, I, I guess for clarity, um, this is sort of that Bible stu study moment uh, when it says, uh, when Jesus says to him, um, uh, it hurts you to kick against the goads. Um, that's not an expression we use. Um, we might uh, say similarly, um, it's hard to swim against the tide. Um, goads were uh, prods um, that uh, that you use to drive sheep or to drive cattle. So to kick against the goads is to go against um, the direction you're supposed to be going in, right? So you're driving the herd that way, someone wants to go the other way, you're kicking against the goads. Um, so there, that mystery solved in case or you probably already knew that. Um, but whenever I bring it up with people, they're always surprised. So, you know, it, it hurts you to swim against the tide as if to, Jesus is saying, what I'm offering, this is inevitable. You're going you're gonna to get it eventually. Why, why are you fighting it? Why don't you just accept it? Um, I, I, I wonder um, about a couple of things here. Um, this is not the first time that we have heard Paul's uh, conversion story. Um, I, I mean, I note he never mentions it in his own letters, um, but... But, uh, but Luke certainly mentions it. This is, what, the third time that it's come up um, in, in the book of Acts? Uh, and, and the story is essentially the same, but a little bit different. So what does that mean? It's essentially the same, but a little bit different. And it's the same author, right? Luke is the one recording all of this. So, you know, um, why wouldn't he just cut and paste the text from earlier on? Why not just say it exactly the same way? Um, well, I, I think, I think, at least I wonder, if, if this isn't Luke's way of saying that, you know, it is important to tell our story. And it's important to tell our story again and again. And it's important to tell our story to different people. And, 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 and not to simply recite it, but to tell it in the moment. When we tell a story, we are going to, we're going to change the emphasis a little bit. Here we get a little more detail um, about what, what, what Jesus said. A um, little more emphasis on, on the Gentiles and turning from darkness to light and the power of Satan to God. Um, and I don't think that that means that, um, Paul, uh, that, that, that Paul is making up his story. Um, but what's important in the story is not always the specific details. It is the heart of the story. And the heart of the story for Paul is that God came to him, Jesus came to him and, 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 and said, why? Why are you fighting me? Stop it. Um, and, and that's the heart of the story. Everything else um, is, 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 is detail. That Paul was then converted, that he turned 180 degrees, changed his mind entirely. That's the heart of the story. Everything else is detail. So I think that you and I are invited um, by this story to, to share our moments of faith when we have felt uh, the presence of God or perhaps when our faith has invited us to change our mind or change our direction. Not only are we invited to reflect on it, but I think we're invited to tell the story, to tell it again and again and again. I don't know about you, but, but in, in, in my family, uh, there are stories told that we, we always laugh about and roll our eyes. My grandfather used to tell the same story about my father 
when he was a boy growing up. And he would tell the story. As soon as he starts to, to tell the story, we'd laugh or we'd roll our eyes. Um, but we listened. And you know what? Um, my grandfather has been dead many decades. I can still recite a version of the story. A story that, by the way, got better with each telling. Um, but I can remember the story. It, it involved my father as a teenager working hard at a summer job, uh, in a hurry to, 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 to meet his dad, my grandfather, to go home after the week's work. And he carried a keg of nails on his shoulder and he was running so that he'd be ready in time. And it impressed my grandfather that his son would work so hard. Um, as time went on, the story would then become two kegs of nails. And then we used to joke it was two kegs of nails and another keg that he'd kick in front of him, all in an effort to be finished work on time, to get the job done and be ready to go home with his dad. Um, we laugh at the story. We roll our eyes at the story. And yet I know that my grandfather loved his son, my father. I know that my grandfather admired how hard he worked. Um, I know that he was proud of him. I know that those are values in our family, uh, love and pride and hard work. Um, that's what's conveyed to me. Uh, I don't know whether it was a box of nails, a keg of nails, maybe it was screws, maybe it was a bag of hammers. I don't know. That doesn't matter. What matters is that my grandfather loved his son, admired his son, was proud of his son. Uh, and valued the work and the effort that he put in. Um, and I, I cherish those stories. So I read through Acts and I hear the same story over and over and over again. I, I think of it the same way. Perhaps, perhaps those who were with Paul and heard him tell the story for the fifth time would roll out, oh God, here we go again. Remember that time that Jesus spoke to him? But they remember that God breaks into our lives. They remember that there is great integrity in changing your mind and changing direction. There's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make you a bad person. It means that you have learned a new thing. I mean, <laughs> if you and I do the same thing our whole lives, is there any evidence of a relationship with God? Um, you know, if, if, we, if we don't change our mind, we don't change our direction, if we don't come to a new understanding now and again, are we really engaging with God? Are we engaging with the world? You know, in, in this story that Paul tells over and over and over again, I see those fundamental values. And so I, I wonder about that story. And, and as I say, I, I noticed that Luke tells the story. Um, Paul never references it in any of his letters. Go read through Romans, read Galatians, read his letters. He doesn't reference uh, this this conversion, um, this road to Damascus story. Um, so maybe, maybe Luke has made it up. Or maybe Paul told the story in person so many times he never had to write it in a letter. Um, but I think the historical accuracy isn't nearly as important as, as what it's conveying, the values that it conveys, and this idea that, that Paul was one way and now he is another. And, and that's what he's offering to Agrippa. That's what he's been trying to offer to, to the Jews, um, the traditional Jews who are not receiving uh, his message well. You know, yes, you are this way, and, that's, and, and, and I honor that, but it is, not, it is not a break. It does not dishonor your past to change your present or to redirect your future. That doesn't dishonor your past. Paul still sees himself as, as a... As as a, as a faithful Jew, as as a as a as a lover of the of of the God of Abraham, it's just that he's changed his path now. In fact, he finds that's what's faithful. He seems stymied. He 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 can't seem to comprehend that 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 you know Jesus has revealed to him the fulfillment of his faith, the faith he was raised in, the promise made to the twelve tribes, the very thing they hoped to attain, is offered in Jesus. And he looks at them, so why won't you folks take it? I don't know about you, but I wonder about that sometimes too. You know, we, we, are, we can be part of groups or communities um, that are dedicated to something. And as we get close to achieving that thing, uh, some balk. Oh, no, no, it's not really happening. As if they have become um, 
dedicated to the journey and are afraid of arriving at the destination. Uh, as if, as if they have become so comfortable and familiar with the struggle that when the struggle looks like it could come to an end, they are afraid and they aren't prepared. So they balk at the very thing, the very thing they have dedicated their lives to. I understand that a little bit. I understand that. Um, so you see, I, I, I wonder a little bit about myself and the things that, uh, that I hope for, but what happens when I get close to achieving them? Um, when I start to, oh yeah, but I'm just, I'm, I'm comfortable in my misery. For goodness sakes, don't give me happiness. I'm good with my struggle. I don't actually want it to end. Um, I think of, 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 of friends who have for decades said, oh my God, I can't wait till I retire. And then as they, as they approach retirement, they're terrified because the work that they do has defined them and they're afraid of losing their their definition, losing their, their shape, losing the, the order to their lives. Is it possible that some of these traditional Jews who are so angry with Paul, they, they, they like living in expectation of a fulfillment yet to come. And when Paul says, yes, but there's a fulfillment right here, then they would lose their definition. They would lose the thing that shapes their lives. They, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not suggesting um, that Christianity um, eliminates the need to be Jewish. I'm not saying uh, that, 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 that Jews just simply fail to see. Uh, we have different perspectives. But that's where Paul is. Trying, he can't figure out why they won't accept it. And, uh, and, and it drives him crazy. And in fact, um, there, there is, there is uh, opposition, mean-spirited, dangerous opposition. They want to kill Paul for offering them what he thinks they've been looking for their whole lives. And this confounds him. And that's part of what he shares. Yeah, I wonder about that in my own life from time to time. But I think that I am more compelled right now about this idea of, of, of telling our story and listening to stories. And it's okay to tell stories over and over again. You know, for the creative among us, uh, those of who like to, to create new things, we, we tend to go to novelty. Uh, oh, I can't tell that story. I've already told it. Uh, I don't want to do that. I've already done it before. Uh, I always want to do a new thing. But sometimes doing the same thing again and again, but doing it with sincerity, doing it with honesty. So it changes a little bit because we didn't just memorize it. We are telling the story from our hearts. Sometimes that is more compelling and it is important. Um, I don't know. Now I'm just going to start to ramble, so I'm going to stop now. But I invite you to wonder about this, about Paul, about, about you, where you are right now, what you're doing right now, what you're going to do tomorrow. Um, wonder out loud. Talk to somebody else. Wonder about that. Because it's in the wondering. Not agreeing with me, because I'm just one person wondering. But it's in the wondering about this story and what it means to you and what it means to another person and sharing that, that's where I believe we discover the Word of God. That's where I just believe God actually speaks to us in that wonder. So please, wonder away. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for, for the story of our faith, a story that is, is shared by many, a story that is ours personally. Let us never be afraid to share the story of our faith. Let us never be afraid to contribute to the story of faith. And let us not be afraid that others contribute to the story of the faith. So it's not just ours. It belongs to the broader community. It belongs to all your children. It belongs to you and us together. Let us continue to wonder and to write the story. We pray through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. So friends, um, we're meeting live at my church tonight for the first time in over six months. Small group, um, kind of excited about it, but I will be checking in with you tomorrow. So um, 
we'll see how things are different tomorrow once I've had an in-person meeting. But whatever is going on for you between now and when we check in again, um, please know that you're not alone. Recognize God's presence. Live your faith. Share your faith as you can. And know that what you do matters. God bless you. See you tomorrow.